Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, uh, welcome to our panel discussion on the ongoing crisis in Israel over, over the Knesset's proposed judicial overhaul. Uh, my name is Stu Jordan. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Rochester, and I'm the associate director of the Democracy Center here at the university. We have a really uh, interesting discussion on what I know you all know is um, an incredibly important topic. So I want us to get us straight to the discussion as fast as possible. So I'm just going to introduce my co-moderator and our panelists, and then we're going to go straight into the discussion. Um, so first of all, co-moderating with me tonight is Michal Raz. I mean, Michal, if you just want to wave so everybody knows who I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Michal is Professor of History and the Charles E. and Dale L. Professor of Public Health and Policy and Professor of Clinical Medicine at the School of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Rochester. Um, in addition to all that, Michal has been the main um, organizing force behind this event, encouraging the Democracy Center and our panelists to get together and organize a discussion on this really important topic. Um, <clears throat> and now for our panelists. Uh, first of all, we have Guy Grossman. Guy, if you want to wave to make sure everybody knows who I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> Guy is professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's an expert on applied political economy with uh, a focus on the intersection of technology and governance, political accountability, forced migration and conflict processes, and a regional focus on sub-Saharan Africa and, of course, the subject of our discussion tonight, Israel-Palestine. I mean, in addition, um, Prof. Gross, uh, Professor Grossman is the founder and co-director of Penn's Development Research Initiative, which is a co-sponsor um, of this evening's discussion. Uh, next, we have Tom Ginsberg. Uh, <clears throat> Tom is uh, the Leo Spitz Distinguished Service Professor of International Law and Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on comparative and international law, and most importantly for our discussion tonight, he's written extensively on the role of legal institutions and democracies, including the recent book, How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, co-authored with Aziz Zihouk. Uh, Tom's also the co-host of the Entitled podcast, which you should definitely check out. It explores the stories and thorny questions around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Um, Tom's also the faculty director of the Malvi Center for the Study of Institutional and Legal Integrity, which is a co-sponsor of tonight's event. And finally, we have Gretchen Helmke. Gretchen, if you want to wave so everybody knows who I'm talking about, Gretchen is the uh, Thomas H. Jackson Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Rochester. She's a founding member of Brightline Watch, which is a nonpartisan research organization dedicated to monitoring threats to democracy in the United States and faculty director of the University of Rochester's Democracy Center. Uh, Gretchen's research focuses on judicial politics and the rule of law, informal institutions and norms, and the comparative study of democratic erosion and polities around the world. And with that, I'll hand it off to my co-moderator, Michal Raz, to start the discussion. Thank you, thank you, Stu. Uh, well, oh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. There's one more thing I needed to say that I forgot to say before I hand it off to you. Um, please use the Q&A function. Um, uh, so in addition to the panelists giving remarks and discussing among themselves, we also want to answer audience questions. So uh, submit your questions using the Q&A function at any time during the discussion. Um, and at the end of the panelist discussion, um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be fielding and discussing a selection of questions from the audience. So submit those questions as they occur to you, please. Okay, sorry, Michal, go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. No, just really pleased that we could um, get this panel of distinguished experts and thank you to all the different institutions and co-sponsors that are creating this and the partners in organizing. And I think it's really crucial to pay attention to what's going on right now. And this is something that is truly unprecedented. Uh, and there have been changes and policies in Israel that have been debated and contested. But what is going on now is truly something different. And trying to unpack why that is different uh, and what are the implications of this, but also what is the system from which it arises uh, and what it actually means, uh, tries to, to make sense of what is actually going on. Uh, and I'm really grateful to all the panelists who are, who are here to help shed light on this. And in particular, I'll pass it over to Professor Guy Grossman to really help us understand the very basics of, of what are we looking at? What does this mean? So thank you, Guy. Great. Uh, thanks, Michal. And uh, first, I want to start by thanking uh, the organizers for inviting me, and and also all the uh, those that are joining us uh, uh, tonight. Uh, there's so many of you that that came, and so that speaks, you know, volume to the fact that this is this is on a lot of our minds. Uh, I'm going to uh, start with like relatively short 
uh, uh, introduction uh, comments that, you know, following uh, Michal's uh, comment, just will lay down the foundation of uh, in what way this proposal is different from, from others and why, why is it so worrisome. And then I hope that we'll have time to also get to, you know, uh, discuss other issues about like, uh, uh, you know, give, give some uh, international, uh, uh, comparative international context, uh, but also go back maybe circle later to talk about like why this protest movement is relatively successful and, and where things are leading because because uh, this proposal uh, that we're going to be talking about, the, the, this judicial overhaul was put on, on the table uh, uh, on January 4th. And, and so today we're like in May, so, you know, things have changed. Uh, and so I, I hope you have also an opportunity to talk about what has changed in the last four months. But let me start by just, uh, um, you know, saying a few words on the, on the proposed uh, judicial overhaul, why we should be worried about it um, and, and, you know, kick us from there. So I don't think it's very controversial to say that the uh, judicial overhaul that the government uh, uh, initially proposed in January 4th and since then uh, started moving through the legislative process in Israel um, is designed to insulate the government from, from scrutiny and, and really subject the courts uh, in Israel uh, to the executive. Uh, I think it's not controversial to say that uh, the goal of the proposed overhaul is to dismantle some of the checks and balances uh, that currently um, exist in the Israeli uh, system. And, and the, the elimination of these checks and balances uh, would be achieved uh, through uh, four pillars uh, of this judicial overhaul that I think you should be, um, um, we should keep in mind and we should be concerned about. Uh, the first uh, uh, pillar is a removal of all forms of judicial review from uh, of, uh, of the legislator. So the Knesset, the Israeli uh, uh, legislator, uh, uh, the proposed uh, uh, amendment to uh, Israel basic laws will shield it completely from, uh, uh, from forms of judicial review, in part by mandating that if the courts strike down a law, uh, the law can go back to the Knesset and they can uh, override the, the courts uh, through a simple majority. So, so that's one pillar, elimination of judicial uh, uh, review. Uh, the other pillar is making it significantly harder for the courts to intervene in executive decision, in government decision, for example, appointments, uh, when, the government de when, the, when the courts in the past have intervened, deeming some government action as unreasonable. Uh, so this will be achieved by removing the ability of the courts to claim that a government decision is uh, unreasonable. The third uh, pillar of the judicial review uh, is, uh, and I think this probably got the most attention and is the, the most sticky uh, point in the negotiation between the government and the opposition parties at the president's, um, is uh, 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 changing the composition uh, and the voting booth of the committee that appoint judges in Israel, such that it will allow the government to have full control over the appointment of judges. Today, the government does not have an ability to control uh, judges. Uh, they have a veto uh, over judges. So there's a committee of nine members. You need a majority of seven. Uh, the, the government effectively control three seats so they can veto, but they can't decide unilaterally who would be uh, uh, a judge. And this is something that uh, the, the, the proposal that we, we have on the table is to provide the government a uh, majority in the, 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 the committee that appoint judges, such as they can completely control uh, uh, who judges are. And the last uh, pillar of the, of the legislation uh, that is being proposed is a weakening and a dramatic weakening of the office of the attorney general. Uh, uh, now in every ministerial uh, 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 office, there's a representative from the attorney general office when they make, a, uh, uh, they, they make an op uh, opinion on, on some constitutional matter, legal matter, uh, the, the uh, recommendations, the, sorry, the opinions are binding and the proposal is to make uh, the opinions not binding, but only a recommendation. Uh, and, and thereby weaken uh, the office of the attorney general. Uh, and, and again, uh, going back to what I said earlier, uh, uh, in, just make the, the government uh, 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 insular from guardians, whether it's the courts, whether it's the office of the attorney general. Now, each of these pillars on its own right may have made sense 
in a different context. For example, you hear a lot of people say, hey, also in the United States, the, 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 the process for uh, uh, appointing judges is political. You know, the president uh, uh, appoints and, and that's a political uh, decision. So, uh, and so we usually, uh, those of us that uh, are worried about the process in Israel, the, the response is, well, A, it's not working so well also in the United States, uh, but, but the, the more serious one is uh, you can't uh, import uh, one pillar or one aspect of another system without thinking about the system in its whole. So I want to say something about some of the unique characteristics of the Israeli system uh, that we have to uh, keep in mind when we're thinking about uh, the proposed uh, overhaul uh, and its pillars that I mentioned uh, before. And so uh, the, the system in Israel um, is characterized by uh, one, uh, the fact that we don't have a constitution in Israel. So uh, the Constitutional Assembly that formed in 1948 disbanded in 1950 without uh, uh, voting uh, for, uh, over a constitution. Um, so that's a, and, and constitutions are, are, tend to be a check on 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 on, uh, on on parliament to begin with. We don't have that check. Uh, uh, Israel doesn't have uh, uh, an, uh, a presidency that is elected independently like we have in the United States. There is a president, but is a it's mostly a ceremonial position. Uh, it's not a veto power. Uh, so that's another weakness of the system. Uh, the third one is that uh, uh, Israel has only one chamber, uh, one Knesset, uh, and not two chambers uh, like uh, like we have in the United States, but one chamber can like check the other one, right? You need to have broad consensus. You need to pass things in Congress and then in Senate. And in the Senate, you also need to have a supermajority. Uh, whether we like that or not, at least it it in, in, it ensures that uh, you know under normal politics you need to seek for broad consensus. In Israel, we have only one chamber uh, where laws uh, pass with a simple majority, right? Uh, which means that whoever is in power doesn't need to seek uh, a consensus, doesn't need to reach to the other side of the aisle, and that provides tremendous power uh, to to uh, uh, to those that are in power to begin with. The, 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 the next thing is that Israel has a, has a parliamentary system, which means that de facto the government enjoys uh, a, a control and support of the Knesset. So unlike, for example, in the United States, where we have a president who is now a Democrat and a Senate and a, a Congress that is controlled by Republicans, we don't have a divided government in Israel. So, uh, so there is really no separation between the executive and, and the Knesset. And so when, the, when we're in the world in which we don't have a constitution, we, have, we don't have a, a, a separation between the executive and the legislator, the one guardians against abuse of power, the one uh, uh, um, uh, uh, guard against uh, 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 possible tyranny of the majority will be the courts. And so we need to understand that uh, the uh, overhaul uh, that will subject the courts to the government is at the background of a system that created the strong courts exactly because of all of those other weaknesses that I just mentioned. The last thing I will just say that Israel is also not a, is a unitary state, it's not a federal state, right? And so, and so you can't even create like these islands of like, you know, that you might, you might have in the United States where you say, okay, I oppose, you know, maybe I care a lot about like, uh, marriage equality, maybe I care a lot about abortions, maybe I will move to New York State or, or Pennsylvania where these are, you know, enshrined. Uh, uh, it's not perfect, but it's it's some, some somewhat of a, of, of, of a solution. That's not the case in Israel, it's a unitary state, and so the decisions of the government apply to all, uh, uh, whether you like them or not. So I, I, I want to stop here to make sure that we have time for, for other discussions, but I, I just want to summarize uh, that the reason we should be worried is because there's weaknesses that are inherent in the system. There's a Supreme Court that is supposed to guard against some of the abuses, uh, and that guard, that system is being dismantled uh, as we speak. Thank you very much, Guy, for these comments, giving us really the foundation to think about these proposals and the system that currently exists. And I'm going to pass it over to Tom Ginsburg, who is going to talk a little bit more about the proposal, but also from a comparative perspective. Thank you, Tom. Terrific. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, yes. Uh, so I study courts around the world. I study constitutions around the world. And when you uh, look at that in a sort of broad perspective, you come to understand that there's not an ideal, you know, universal balance between judicial independence, which is an important value, uh, 
and judicial accountability, which is another reported value that's in some tension. You know, courts that are, um, you know, too independent, if I can use the term, can impose their opinions on everyone else, their particular views. Courts that are too accountable can't play the important role of protecting minorities, of protecting rights that Guy was referring to. And of course, this has been a debate in Israel now for 25 years, uh, really since the rise of the uh, uh, the court, since the passage of the 1992 basic laws, which created new rights uh, that were understood at the time of their passage by the Likud government as being a constitutional revolution. And then, of course, um, that process was, that football, if you will, to use an American metaphor, was taken by the court under uh, Chief Justice Aaron Barak, and he ran a long way with that. And so I think it is important in these discussions to recognize that the Israeli Supreme Court is an extremely powerful court and has been, and, um, you know, in ways that, you know, are legally controversial as well as politically controversial in Israel. Um, there has been, of course, as we often see around the world, some pushback, and there was reforms already to the judicial appointments uh, system some years ago. And from my faraway perspective, the court has become much more moderate in this regard. It hasn't been simply legislating uh, new rules for Israeli society. It has, in other words, responded to the general conversations that we see in all democracies about the scope of judicial power. We have this here in the United States. Recent discussions in the U.S., should we reform the court? Well, we're not going to do that, but just the discussion can sometimes affect the court. And of course, we also have engaged in various institutional reforms, all without ending our democracy. So that's a, just a general background point. Um, it is my opinion <laughs> that, you know, and we, we see a lot of hyperbolic discussion around these things in the U.S. and in Israel. I don't believe that these reforms are themselves the end of Israeli democracy. That's my opinion, not a fact in response to that brief question that was in the chat. Um, but it does, in fact, lay the groundwork for further reforms that would, if, you know, if adopted by a simple coalition of 61 votes in the Knesset, uh, could really deal a body blow to democracy because democracy is obviously more than whoever's in the majority this week gets to do whatever they want. Democracy obviously depends at a very minimal definition on rights of freedom of assembly and association and speech and voting. And also, in my opinion, uh, the work Aziz Huck and I have uh, focused on is the rule of law, the bureaucratic rule of law. People are going to count the votes honestly. Um, the virtue of civil service that you know follows the instructions of elected politicians, which kind of reduce the stakes of politics. So um, you know, those kind of reforms to those aspects, I think, you know, would be opened up by this reform. So it's my opinion that when you have major institutional reforms, I think Guy has described them very well. And in particular, what I would focus on is the combination of changing the appointment system to become more political with the presence of an override, which is found in some democracies, Canada and New Zealand, where the courts, if they make an interpretation that the politicians don't like them, political branches can override that opinion. Um, when you have those two things together, you have a very weak court. You have what's likely to be a very politicized court. You know, when politicians control the appointments, then we get more politicized courts. Comparative research is pretty clear on that point. And um, in the Israeli context, I do worry a little bit about that combination. We have some examples where there have been sudden major constitutional changes, small c in this case, um, adopted by temporal majorities. Poland and Hungary, you hate to use those examples, but in those countries, the quality of the judges on those courts now, the constitutional courts, is very low. They're not distinguished jurists, they're political hacks. And that's what something no one should want if they care about the rule of law. So I do worry about the lack of consensus. And I'm pleased that there's this kind of effort now to negotiate under the auspices of the unelected president. I think that's a really good process. There are many possible outcomes, but if it's adopted by consensus, then that's great. Uh, if it's not, I really do worry about the future of the country, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much for these comments. Um, and then I'll pass it over to, to Gretchen Humpty. She'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about judicial overhaul in general and from a comparative perspective, as well as democratic black backsliding around the world and what we can fear, perhaps, or what we can learn from other countries about these processes. So go ahead, Gretchen. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mikhail. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, we're really happy to be discussing uh, such an important issue. Um, 
So I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to step back from the specifics of the Israeli crisis and, and try to offer um, something of a broader global perspective that I ho am hoping underscores three main points. Um, the first one is just how dangerous attacking courts can be for the health and stability of democracy. And I think both Guy and, and Tom have suggested some of the ways in which um, it does threaten the health of democracy. Um, I also want to emphasize, though, just how common this strategy has been under, Democrat, under democratically elected governments around the world, um, and in particular in Latin America, which is the part of the world that uh, I've spent a lot of my career focusing on. Um, but I also want to emphasize how variable the outcomes of this process have been. Sometimes governments have succeeded in getting the court that they want, uh, but this has not always been the case. And I think it's important to recognize just how much uh, variation there is. Um, so when it comes to the challenges um, of, of democratic backsliding and the role that courts can play, I think it's, I think it's really important to recognize that in any democracy, Courts are uniquely valuable institutions, and they're also uniquely vulnerable institutions. Uh, so the first point: why why are they so vulnerable? Uh, why are they so valuable? Well, I think I think Tom laid this out, but essentially, I think the main answer comes down to recognizing that what makes a democracy a democracy is not simply that it's a majoritarian system in which the latest election determines everything, it's really a set of rules for peacefully allocating power uh, that endures over time. And in order to make elections endure over time, um, it's absolutely fundamental that there be a protection of, of minority rights um, and that there be a rule of law. And courts obviously are one of the key institutions, if not the key institution, that makes sure that that happens. So uh, on the one hand, right, courts are incredibly valuable because they're playing this counter-majoritarian role, but precisely because they're playing that role, they often can easily sort of get painted as being anti-democratic. Um, and I think we see this, you know, not just as part of the rhetoric in, in Israel on the right, justifying the reforms, but we see this sort of attempt to um, paint courts by popularly elected officials uh, in the name of or furthering or protecting democracy. We see this sort of around the world, not just in Latin America, but this was a really um, sort of uh, common rhetorical strategy used in Hungary, uh, used in Poland, and also used very effectively, I think, um, in, in Turkey. Um, so let me talk just a little bit about um, how common uh, this this is. So in the research that I've done on Latin America, since there was a wave of transitions to democracy in the 1980s, it turns out that about a third of all elected governments in the region have tried at some point or another to capture the courts. And we're really familiar with the cases where they have been very successful in doing that and where judicial independence has been utterly destroyed. So the case that comes to mind is Chavez in Venezuela and then even more uh, extremely under uh, Maduro in, in Venezuela. Um, but we could also think about uh, what's going on right now in El Salvador under Bukele. Uh, he has managed to um, you know, get a lot of power in the legislatures, mainly through elections, but then he's used that to go after the courts, and he remains one of the most popular presidents, if not the most popular president in Latin American history. I think his approval ratings are somewhere uh, north of 80%. Um, there have been examples, though, and I, I hope we get a chance to talk about this more in the, in the Q&A, where courts have been targeted, they've been threatened, but um, the attacks have not been successful. So one of the cases that I'm thinking about specifically is Colombia under uh, Alvaro Uribe. Um, he like uh, kind of was a, in the presidency around the same time Chavez was. He tried a lot of the same moves that Chavez did, but ultimately he was unsuccessful. And as a result of him being unsuccessful, the court actually in turn played a major role in limiting his ability to run for uh, a third reelection. And it really helped uh, democracy uh, survive um, in, in Colombia. 
Um, so I think I just have a couple more minutes, but one thing I, I really want to point out is that everywhere politicians want to stay in power, everywhere politicians would prefer a court who makes decisions that support their policies, uh, that don't challenge them. But I think when courts really get in trouble, a couple of factors come together. One is that the society is really polarized. Uh, that an outsider comes into office and that it's able to exploit that to go after institutions. And again, kind of, as I was saying before, <laughs> paint what they're doing as, as actually enhancing democracy, not limiting democracy. Um, the other factor though, that I think hasn't been mentioned so far is um, how popular or how much legitimacy or trust there is in the courts at the outset. Uh, and here I'd be very um, interested to hear what both Guy and Tom have to say about uh, sort of the, the you know, public support for um, the court in Israel before this whole crisis began. I can tell you in, in Latin America, it's the courts that have you know, um, public approval ratings or trust ratings in the single digits that are really, really prone uh, to these kinds of attacks and really vulnerable when they get attacked. Um, so, uh, in the interest of opening up the discussion, I will turn it back over to Michal. Michal, do you think I can, I, I can have two minutes just to respond to something? Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, yeah. please go ahead. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks Tom, and uh, thanks, Gretchen, for your, your opening comments. Uh, just, uh, I want to, uh, two minutes on, on, on some, on a few things that, uh, that, uh, Tom said. Uh, I agree that the Israeli court is extremely, like, I court is extremely powerful, but it's also, I think it's important to keep um, in mind that it, it has been restrained, right? Like, so over 30 years, it's struck down a small number of laws, parts of laws, I think 22, uh, and uh, it does not intervene almost at all, rarely intervenes in issues that are related to security, right? And so I think I think it's important to to also um, uh, clarify. But I, I think a deeper thing you said that you're not, more, like, uh, was whether this will be the end of democracy or not. And... And so I wanna, I, 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 I think people should also, um, you know, uh, we should keep in mind that like part of the recommendations or some part of the proposal on the table that there's no judicial review of basic laws, okay? Removing basic laws at all from all forms of judicial review. But because Israel doesn't have a constitution, um, there's no document that tells us what, what qualifies as a basic law, right? Uh, and so just kind of paraphrasing the Federalist Papers that said like, you know, if, if men were angels, right, no government would necessary. So if I, I would paraphrase, if government were angels, we wouldn't need a powerful high court, but governments are no angels. They want to stay in power, as Gretchen told us. So what prevents a government from passing a basic law that says only Zionist parties can run for office? Mm -hmm. Basically disqualifying, basically dis disenfranchising 20% of the uh, Israeli public. What prevents the government from passing a basic law on Netanyahu prime minister forever, for life? I mean, life presidency, there are, and Pinochet was declared president for life, right? Why is it? So, and so when people raise that, the answer is usually, well, we obviously won't do that. And the answer is, obviously we don't trust you because if you have the power to do that, who will, how can you guarantee that you won't do that. So the, I think democracy works best. I mean, crazy laws don't pass when they know that they can't pass. Crazy laws do pass when there's no guardrails to protect them. So my concern is being in a system where there's no uh, there's no checks because I just don't trust government, not from neither from the right nor from the left, to not use the power that they have in a way that will uh, you know eliminate uh, kind of the you know, will 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 uh, will not enshrine them in power, uh, uh, and and will not target uh, uh, groups that they 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 they, they seek to target. Tom, did you want to um, take a minute to answer that? Or, I mean, I think we're basically on the same page. It's a Madisonian answer, but I mean, I do think it's important to recognize the court has used this reasonable doctrine, reasonableness doctrine, which of course is a very old common law doctrine, which is necessary. I mean, that's maybe. The most disturbing thing is that if you got rid of that, then administrative law review all disappears and government could do all kinds of crazy things. So I agree, it's a very big thing, a big thing. But it's also important to recognize that one of the reasons this coalition is really upset about the court is because the court has invented a doctrine found nowhere else that I know of that not only can convicted criminals not sit in cabinet, but even people who've been indicted 
cannot sit in cabinet. Um, and that's just sort of under a reasonableness doctrine. So, you know, we can we don't, we don't want to bore the audience with a debate about Israeli jurisprudence, but I think it is important to recognize that that is a particular threat to this coalition because so many of them have been <laughs> indicted. And it is thus, that's another reason in some sense to distrust this current set of reforms. And it almost looks like this isn't really about the particular interest of the Israeli public or the balance of power in some theoretical way. It's almost like an act of vengeance. And that's what I worry about as well. Um, I just wanted to underscore Guy's sort of more general point about the importance of uh, an independent court essentially deterring uh, governments from passing sort of wacky legislation. Um, there's a new book that came out by uh, Professor Jeff Staten at Emory with some co-authors that makes exactly this argument that a lot of times the importance of having an independent judiciary is not what you do see, but what you don't see. Uh, so it's encouraging sort of prudential behavior, both on the part of the government, but also on the part of the opposition. Yeah, that's great. We have a, a few minutes now for discussion on uh, for the panelists uh, and some questions, and then we'll open it up for the Q&A from the audience. Um, and I have a few questions for you, but I think Gretchen had one that she brought up in her own comments about the role of the Supreme Court and how it's perceived in Israeli society. And, you know, I follow a lot of the, um, of the of demonstrations in Israel and I see my, ch my children's friends in baby onesies that say, you know, I love the Supreme Court or we love the guts. Um, and obviously now Israelis have discovered that they love the Supreme Court. But I, I would love to hear um, from the panelists if they would like to talk about perceptions of the Supreme Court that preceded uh, the uh, overhaul. Just uh, that was a question that you had for us, Gretchen. So um, if somebody wants to say something about that. I have something to say, if that's all right, which is, of course, um, you know, and it gets to the nature of these protests. One of my Israeli friends described it as the Ashkenazi Intifada, you know, that it was <laughs> essentially, you know, riots and things like this, but it was a very, you know, in a, in a broad sector of Israeli society, but a specific sector very famous article about judicialization in Israel where he says, you know, this is basically like the, the, the liberal Ashkenazi elite thinking that they were going to lose power. So they created more, more power in the courts. I don't want to, you know, argue about it, the accuracy of this thesis, but um, it, um, you know, I think that it depends who you ask. So for religious party, religious parties, I think they don't see the court as their friend. I think the hard right does not see the court as their friend. I think um, Arab Israelis, I'm not in a position to answer. It is important to rebut one position that's been put out there in the in the public discussion, which some people say, hey, if this was really a bad reform, we'd see the Arab Israelis out there too. And, you know, the working class people. And, you know, I mean, having been on a panel or two with some um, Arab Israelis, their attitude is, well, this isn't really our fight. You know, we might, we might, we'd certainly prefer to have a court than not, but we're not going to go and, you know, risk our, uh, you know, conflict with the police, which obviously, as in this country, is differentially, uh, you know, there are differential risks, depending who you are, to go out there. So I think the court's strongest base of support is essentially in Tel Aviv, I think it's safe to say. Um, so I don't know, Guy, would you agree with that? or is, is if uh, With nuance, I, I think you're right, but I think with I want to nuance it. Uh, so it's true that the court is liberal, not in liberal as like you know, progressive, but liberal as in the European sense of the world, and uh, and uh, and I think that's 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 accurate. And I think that if you are illiberal, like on a, like an urban illiberal, uh, then you're not a friend of the court. And you know, uh, as in many places, uh, ideology and and class and in Israel, when we say if we can say ethnicity, if we talk about Ashkenazi, they all. Uh, you know, uh, highly correlate. So I don't know if it's necessarily Ashkenazi as much as like, a, you know, kind of a center left, uh, a liberal, more um, uh, kind of global, Twitter kind of like class, like uh, that uh, feels uh, that, uh, you know, that has enjoyed, you know, some of the protections of the court. But but uh, more, 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 more to the matter, I also think that, uh, you know, Another way of nuancing is that uh, effectively since 1996, the right is in power. I mean, yeah, with small stints, right? 
uh, you know, for like the last 27 years, the right is in power, right? And people that are in power tend to not like the courts because the courts like, uh, you know, I check against those that are in power. So effectively, part of the reason that like the right doesn't like the court is, is because the court has, you know, has stopped some of the agenda of the right, but not because necessarily it's right. Uh, in part, you know, a lot of the decisions that were struck down, that administrative decision, government have really nothing to do with like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or you know, you know, some of them, you know, uh, you know, I, these are these are just like when you are not, when you are in power, you don't like the court so much, right? Uh, and when you are uh, because the court tends to protect uh, liberal courts tend to protect minorities, so so just nuancing it that you know that part of part of it is also a function of who's been in power in the last like thirty years. And I, the last thing I will just say that like when you say this is just like a small kind of, you know, at some points there's like five, six percent of the population are out, you know, uh, protesting. I, I would push a little bit against like describing this as, uh, you know, uh, Ashkenazi Tel Aviv avant-garde. Uh, this might have been the case in the first three, four weeks of the of the protest that like, you know, mostly was a, a, a Tel Aviv phenomena. But by week 13 and 14, uh, we were talking about like, a massive number of people are in, even in like Likud strongholds uh, in Be'er Sheva, in Ashdod, uh, uh, people have been uh, protesting. When you look at the pictures of like who's protesting, it's not just Ashkenazi. Uh, it is true that like uh, uh, there's also people from the right. There's also people with like yarmulkes. Um, I, I think that if it was just like a Tel Aviv thing, it would have it would have passed. Like if Netanyahu would have thought that this is a Tel Aviv uh, uh, um, uh, kind of a, a Tel Aviv uh, movement trying to keep its own rights, we will not have this discussion now. We would be having a discussion of post-reform. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. The reason that this movement has been successful in stopping uh, the, uh, the legislation from moving forward in part is because it was very, very good at creating coalitions that go beyond Tel Aviv. Uh, and if people are interested, I, I have a few thoughts of why, how and why they were able to succeed doing that. May I jump in? Of course, that's right. And um, when we look at what's happened in the last few weeks, the key moments are the Histad route, the labor unions announcing, you know, possibility of a general strike. And then, of course, the firing of the Minister of Defense. Because one thing about Israel is the central institution, after all, is the military. Um, you know, and um, when you start messing around with what the generals are saying, I think that was also a really critical moment. That's when you really saw the escalation and the and the concession finally from this coalition, which was ramming through the reform without regard. Um, so yes, that broad base coalition was critical. I was just quoting my Israeli friend about the Ashkenazi Intifada, but obviously it's a broader base. The question was about the support for the court, and there I think it's not. You know, the courts do protect minorities, but, you know, the religious minorities in Israel don't feel like they're being well protected by the court. Well, maybe that's an opportunity to think about the next question, which you've already touched on, which is, you know, this is a huge protest that's been gaining momentum and has managed to obtain quite a few concessions uh, and has quite a bit of success. Uh, and so maybe you want to discuss, you know, where do you think the source of this protest success is you've identified the broad coalition already and a few key moments uh but perhaps you want to um, add a little bit more of context for that for our, our um for for our listeners yeah if, if if it's okay i'll take that but i'll try to be mm -hmm. really brief uh so so first of all i think it's a very successful uh protest movement uh i mean um it's 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 more board based than uh, uh than tel aviv it managed to sustain itself on like 19 weeks which is quite amazing so it's amazing both in terms of its durability but also in the breadth the the, the depth and uh, uh, uh and, and the outreach to to populations that have not been uh, mobilized in recent years a lot of the people that are go out are people that haven't haven't protested in in at least uh, two decades and how they've done it i think there's like three key uh, uh, key factors for success. The first one that the movement is not led by politicians and it's uh, it's not partisan. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, I think that uh, uh, if anything, they are even pushing the, the politicians away. I think uh, this created a psychological space for people from the 
center right and and and, and right to join it because uh, by joining the protest they're not necessarily uh, uh, strengthening a, a, any one uh, uh, opposition party. I think that that has been uh, really important in the first four or five weeks. Uh, Lapid, which is effectively the opposition leaders, didn't even show up to this like to these like uh, uh, protests. So that's one. The second thing that the protest was able to get the backing of three groups that tend to be apolitical in Israel uh, and uh, don't uh, uh, throw themselves into uh, many fights, but they carry a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of weight. Uh, the first one uh, is the kind of the CEO and workers of the tech industry. They 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 tend to just like mind their own business and 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 and, and power the economy. They come out swinging uh, uh, together with the economy, saying uh, talking about the uh, the damage to the economy. The second group, which is probably uh, the most important group, uh, just uh, reserve soldiers and officers that came out saying we uh, vol we love our country. We volunteer to serve and fight for our country, but we. We, we volunteered to serve and fight for democracy. Uh, we didn't uh, 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 sign up to fight for a dictatorship or autocracy. And if and they warned and 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 quite uh, and, and made a, a very strong warning that the the militaries, the people military, because the mandatory service in Israel will crumble uh, uh, and they will not come uh, uh, and serve uh, if the if the legislation passes. I think this was a very credible. Uh, uh, threat and 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 a lot of people took that very seriously. The third group that came out, uh, the national security apparatus, uh, uh, you know, like former uh, uh, Shabak, former uh, Mossad uh, members coming out and saying that the foundation of Israel national security is based on an alliance with the West. This alliance is based on common values like democracy and human rights, and the reform can jeopardize this alliance uh, if our uh, our um, uh, uh, allies will view Israel as kind of exiting uh, kind of the the, the 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 community of democracy lovers and human rights uh, supporters. Just on that issue, I think the third pillar, which is related to to the national security group, is the Biden administration. The fact that Biden refused to invite Netanyahu as is as is customary. So it's customary when the new government is formed. The the, the president of the United States invite. Uh, the the prime minister uh, to demonstrate the, the the strength of the alliance uh, that's part of the pillar of Israel's uh, uh, security. The fact that Biden publicly and explicitly said, "I'm not going to invite uh, Netanyahu," uh, I think sent a shockwaves uh, in the uh, Netanyahu administration, sent a shockwave to the public that is worried that the United States will withdraw its bipartisan support. That's part of a, a big pillar of Israel's national security. And so these three things, and that's what got. Uh, also the 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 Shabak and the Mossad uh, uh, leadership out. So these three things: the nonpartisan element of the uh, of the, uh, the the of the movement, the fact that they uh, they were able to enlist groups that have a lot of uh, weight, and the uh, the the, uh, uh, the fact that the Biden administration didn't waver and didn't uh, invite uh, Netanyahu. I think these three uh, are really important in understanding the success of these movements. Out there. I saw Gretchen, you had like this one. Yeah, if I could just add a little bit of a comparative perspective here. I, I think, at least from where I sit, the thing that makes Israel really ex exceptional is not the fact that the government's going after the court, but the, the reaction to it and the size of the protests. Um, it's not that it's unheard of, right? There have been protests in other countries against judicial uh, you know, um, attacks. Uh, I think in in, in Pakistan, uh, this happened. Um, certainly in Poland, I think uh, there were protests that that you know made a big difference in this. But at least in in the part of the world that I study, what's sort of the average or the norm is that you know no one shows up, and if anything, the approval rating of the president goes up after after doing something like this. Uh, so I think I think the fact that people are out on the streets and in such large numbers. Um, really does distinguish uh, Israel from a lot of um, a lot of the cases that I'm familiar with. The one exception would be Ecuador in 2004. Uh, the president at the time was desperately trying to stay in power, and so he sort of 
tried to please his coalition by essentially remaking the court so that they would drop charges against a former president and their party leader. Uh, and that ended up just completely backfiring and exploding precisely because he couldn't really couch it in the language of democracy and reform. He tried to, but it was so clearly a move where he was personally clinging to power that uh, people came, even though the courts weren't particularly popular, people came out on the streets and he was basically forced out of office. I want to add one point about these particular um, protests, which is a really remarkable thing about it, which is when you think about these issues we're talking about, Guy's presentation at the outset, these are really technical issues, you know, judicial appointments, the reasonableness doctrine. These are not things that get the man in the street or the woman on the street out to the streets in most countries. And remarkably, from my perspective, this was actually a process of education by professors. Um, you know, I have a number of uh, friends and colleagues who would go to bars and pubs and cafes and talk to people and try to explain what was at stake. And that's really fairly unusual. Uh, those of us in the academy sometimes feel like, well, we can't really do anything, but they did get their hands dirty. I think that's an important role, uh, point thing to point out. In terms of the U.S. role here, one thing that's been being said now is, oh, the Biden should just keep out of it. This is our business. And I have a rather strong reaction to that because of... Um, just thinking back to the Romney election and Netanyahu's decision to essentially, um, you know, run against the Democrats to come speak to Congress and to criticize Obama's policies. You know, obviously countries do this all the time, but just as an American, I think that, you know, if you really want bipartisan support, you got to be neutral. And if you're going to break those rules, then, you know, if Biden is under no obligation to do anything to support you. Um, so I think there's a longer context here for U.S.-Israeli relations, and I also um, rather arrogantly as, a, as an American citizen think, you know, stay out of our hair. If I had any hair, I would say stay out of it. Um, and if, if, if you're not going to play, play nice, then there's no reason for us to play nice. One other final point I just want to say is a lot of the funding for this institute, which has been promoting these things, comes from America. It's, uh, so there's always American, you know, hands at some level. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand it to Stuart, who is going to share some of the questions from the audience uh, for further debate. Yeah. So we have we have one question from the audience. And again, audience members, if you have additional questions, please go ahead and submit them, because I know the panelists would love to be able to respond to whatever questions you have. Um, so James Spiller asks, uh, uh, does the political right in Israel, I assume he's talking about the political right in Israel, regard the court as not its friend because it regards court rulings as against its interests? or because it is illiberal, um, by which I'm assuming um, Mr. Spiller means, you know, it, it objects to judicial review just absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, maybe I'll say one word. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a mistake to think about all the right as one uh, kind of a unitary uh, group. Uh, the, the government now in Israel is made of a coalition of different parties and different parties uh, have a stake on the Supreme Court that is that is just different, right? And so I'll start, for example, from the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredi uh, parties. Uh, they really care about uh, insulating themselves from uh, the larger population. They want to uh, get an exemption from the military. Uh, they want to get, uh, 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 they want to have uh, education systems that is independent from the public education system. In the past, the high court uh, uh, in Israel, has struck down some arrangements that allowed them a preferen there was like a preferential treatment for uh, for Haredi uh, male that will not need to serve in the military. The, the 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 court struck it down, saying, "Hey, you know that that comes against uh, you know uh, the the principle of equality," uh, and that that has been like a real thorn uh, uh, in 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 their side. And and when the Haredis are now talking about the the uh, um, overriding uh, 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 a clause. It's all, that's the only thing that, that's the main thing that they care about. And it's because of uh, the fact that by June, uh, the government needs to uh, make an arrangement on, uh, about recruiting a Haredi uh, to the military. So it's really kind of like about that, right? Less about like, you know, say the, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and, you know, protection of like Palestinian, like private land, which is something that like the, the, the Zionist Jewish parties uh, care a lot about, right? So the Zionist Jewish parties, not the Haredi, the, 
they they care a lot about uh, deepening the control of uh, of Israel in in the West Bank, what they call Judea and Samaria. And for them, the Supreme Court is uh, has, a, has been an obstacle for for uh, kind of uh, deepening the control uh, of of Israel uh, east of the of the Green Line. And, and that's a very different thing of what the, the Haredis necessarily care about. So I, I think I think it really needs to be kind of party by party. And if you ask me about the Likud, I think the Likud after 30 years in power are not very ideological. They care about going back to what Tom said in the beginning. It's much, much more personal. Who you can like, you know, making sure that Netanyahu can still serve as a prime minister or with his indictment, making sure that uh, the court uh, doesn't interfere in when they when they assign uh, when they provide uh, uh, government position and, and 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 other positions to some of the um, relatives and friends in 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 the liquid center and and I think it's a lot more about corruption rather than ideology. So I, I really think that like uh, we should separate uh, the, these the different motivations. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so Larry Brozier asks about the lack of engagement um, by Arab Israelis in the protests. Um, and uh, he, he says that, you know, uh, isn't one of the key roles that the court plays um, in Israeli politics, the protection of minorities. And if that's the case, why don't we see more engagement from Arab Israelis? Or And I believe, I believe it was um, uh, Tom, who who said this, you know, what, in what sense do Arab really see this as not their fight if protection of minorities is part of the role that the court plays? Well, I mean, you know, I think I said, if, I think there's a, first of all, a sense like, you know, when you see the protests, everyone's wrapped in Israeli flags. It's a Zionist protest in some sense. It's, it's, it's to go back to the Declaration of Independence and to, you know, secure those sort of fundamental values of, of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. I can see why Arab Israelis wouldn't be rushing to the streets, even though I'm sure they'd rather have, you know, the current system than uh, the, pr the prospect of what Guy was talking about, where you really could imagine a uh, coalition saying, well, you know, in order to run, in order to vote, you have to swear allegiance, you know, to Zionist ideals or something like that, or in order to have a political party, um, you need to subscribe to certain rules. So um, I think that's that's my account of it, but Guy maybe knows better than me. No, I I, I completely agree, but I, I it's funny, when we, we talked before about like the, the success of the movement and what accounts for it, there was a fourth factor that I didn't mention, but I think now it's, it's important to mention uh, following you. Uh, the movement made a strategic decision in the beginning to delink the Israeli-Palestinian kind of question from the judicial overhaul question. Traditionally, when the center center left uh, goes to protest, uh, everything that is political has also like the Palestinian Israeli-Palestinian. They made a, 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 a decision to delink, not to mention that at all, and to recapture the symbols of the Zionist state, the flag, the anthem, right? And so, and which which was usually what we see in white uh, uh, protests, but not in in, in center. A left protest, and and that decision was a, a, a key in broadening the Jewish base of the protest, but it came at the expense of excluding uh, uh, the Arabs. I think a key moment was, I think, in around week three, four, uh, all the opposition um, uh, uh, party leaders had a press conference. I think it was like week four, five. Uh, you know, you saw Gantz and Lapid and Lieberman and. Uh, you know, and Merav uh, Michaeli, they all sat and said, like, together, we, there's no parties here. We're all against this reform. And they didn't invite the Arab parties, right? Like, uh, and I think that was very telling. And so I think, I think this idea that, like, uh, uh, you know, be, be, you know, this decision to make this really about uh, going back to the ideals of the Declaration of Independence, as, as Tom said, and make this a reaffirmation of Zionist ideals of democracy, uh, you know, play the double-edged sword. It broadened the Jewish base of the protest, but excluded at the expense of excluding the Arabs. Thank you. Um, so Yonatan Shapir says, uh, it gives, has an elephant in the room question, I think. Like, um, uh, wasn't, isn't Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, indicted for bribery and breach of trust? Uh, you know, what role does that play in this? Why haven't you talked about that? <laughs> Well, I think I did. Um, I, I think I mentioned that. But the current doctrine of the Supreme Court is modified so that you can um, 
serve as prime minister while under indictment, even though he couldn't he couldn't uh, serve if he was convicted, is my understanding of current Supreme Court doctrine. But um, so this raises kind of an interesting counterfactual. Suppose um, during the brief period of the coalition government, uh, you know, before Netanyahu came back, they had just withdrawn the prosecution, the corruption prosecution. You know, would he have come back? Would he have insisted on joining forces with these other coalition partners that really wanted to destroy the court? I don't know. It's kind of interesting to think about. Sometimes prudence should win out over the rule of law. And I actually think that's true in the United States, too. Um, and so it raises interesting general questions about, you know, about um, political accountability versus legal accountability is the way I tend to think about it. Um, so, but in any case, you know, that is a major part of the story. The questioner is correct. Um, but I think it has to do with why Netanyahu decided to, you know, go along with this particular group of people who had their own independent reasons for attacking the court um, and have basically been nursing a grievance, some of them, uh, since 1995, since the decision which created judicial review in Israel. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add that, like, we don't know what's in Netanyahu's head, right? Like, and so uh, I think part of the reason why it's problematic to have a prime minister serve uh, under such indictment uh, is exactly because you never know when they take an action, whether it's a principled action, uh, or an action that is is to benefit them personally, right? And so uh, we wouldn't know. I mean, I think there's the right has, uh, you know, and, and especially the the, the 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 justice minister has been championing for a long time the idea that there needs to be a, a big overhaul of the of the court. We, you know, the the court become too strong, and 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 and, and uh, I think there's the the Haredim have very good reasons to. Uh, to neutralize uh, the court. So I, I don't think that this is just like about like Netanyahu pulling the whole country, the crisis, in order to get uh, away with 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 his, his indictment. I think that's a simple, that will do to be too much of a uh, simplicity of uh, simplifying a, a much more complicated story. Obviously, it's in the back of his mind, right? Uh, but if the only thing that he mattered was is not to be in prison, I think uh, there had, he had many opportunities along the way to sign uh, some plea deal uh, that would keep him out of prison. Gretchen, could you comment on on the role of criminal prosecution and and courts in democracies and sort of especially criminal prosecution of political leaders and, and how that plays out in general? Sure. I mean, this is, a, again, a huge problem in, in other countries. Um, some of the research I've done on Latin America uh, you know, very high number of presidents who leave office end up uh, under some kind of investigation or indictment. Fewer spend time in jail, but this is just a really common pattern. Uh, we see it right now, for example, in Brazil with Bolsonaro. Uh, he kind of went after the court, wasn't particularly successful, was voted out of power, and now he is the subject of a probe by the, by the Supreme Court. So this is just a really common sort of, um, I wouldn't call it tit for tat, right? If the court remains independent, uh, there's probably a good basis for them um, investigating someone. But I also really agree with, with Tom's point that there are very sharp trade-offs. And once you have a court that starts going down this path, even if the court is not acting in a politicized way, it, depending on how polarized the society is, how much legitimacy the former leader retains, it's going to affect the court, the perception of the court, at least among some segment of the population. So again, I wouldn't necessarily come down on one side or the other. It sort of depends on the case, but there really are um, potentially long-term costs for the court getting involved in prosecuting former leaders. One country that comes to mind is Peru, you know, where it's yes. Like basically every leader has been impeached and every leader has been indicted and, you know, and the, and they have protests in the streets and it's just, you know, politics yeah. is really not functioning. Right. Uh, so sometimes you kind of have to overlook some things. You know, when I look at the Netanyahu corruption stuff, it doesn't look like much to me. You know, the biggest charge is that he um, leaned on a, uh, on a newspaper for favorable coverage, you know, in return for regulatory benefits. Okay, that's definitely misuse of the public uh, power. Um, but boy, 
I think every American president is doing certain things like that. And certainly, you know, I live in Chicago. I mean, this is like, <laughs> even rise to the attention of a prosecutor. Now, I'm not trying to excuse it. I'm just saying that, you know, there's relative degrees of impunity. The people in Latin America, the, all the Peruvian presidents were taking, you know, millions of dollars from the Brazilian construction company. Um, so, you know. But Tom, just to be fair, like, uh, we don't have a French system, right? Like, uh, the court has no saying in like in indicting Netanyahu. There's a there's an a, attorney general uh, and the you know prosecution that is like relatively independent in Israel, and they decide what comes before the court, and then the court votes. Right. So this is not a system where the courts decided that like Netanyahu should be indicted. Just to be clear, this has been decided by a string of uh, attorney generals, including one that has been appointed by Netanyahu as uh, and served as uh, in, a, in a position of, uh, that, uh, like a loyalty position. He was, he was Maskir Mamshala, which is like the secretary, it was like basically, you know, equivalent to something like a chief of staff, right? And so, and he made uh, a decision that like there's enough there. So I, 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 we can decide, we can agree or disagree on whether this is enough to indict, but I also want to be very clear that it's not the courts in Israel that have, have put that forward. All right. Well, we are we are a, a little bit over time here, so we're, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. And I want to thank all of our audience members and make sure that you all know that we are going to be uh, putting the recording of this session along with the transcript. We'll make that publicly available. Um, I will send out an email to everyone who's registered for the event um, with a link to that recording. Once we have it posted, we'll likely have it on the University of Rochester's YouTube channel. I want to thank our panelists um, for their comments tonight. Um, I also want to thank the Malgi Center for the Study of Institutional and Legal Integrity at the University of Chicago as a, as a co-sponsor, and I want to thank Penn's Development Research Initiative um, at the University of Pennsylvania as a co-sponsor and the Democracy Center at the University of Rochester, and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you.